Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. Today's webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA, and it is being hosted by Val Story. Val is a project director here at CESA. Our topic for today is Community Campaigns for Renewable Heating and Cooling Technologies, Part 1. This is Part 1 of 2. The next webinar will be taking place next week. We're glad that you're here today. Before we get started, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can connect using your computer mic and speakers, or you can call in using a telephone. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the webinar full screen, you can click on the little orange arrow that you see circled here. Uh, you can also use that arrow to expand your webinar console. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions and your comments as you're thinking of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on the webinar console and hitting send. We're going to save about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A with the audience and we'll get to as many questions as we can. To make sure that we get to your question, type it in early. When you think of it, don't wait until the very end. But of course, if you have questions at the end, that is also perfectly fine. Just type them in when you've got them. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a link to the webinar recording and a link to the PDF of the slides within 24 to 48 hours, but probably this afternoon. And a recording of the webinar will also be posted on CESA's website at cesa.org backslash webinars. And this is a good URL to know because it's also where we post information about upcoming webinars, including the part two in this webinar series. So with that out of the way, I'd like to turn this over to our host for today's webinar, Val Story. As I said at the beginning, Val is a project director here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and she is going to get the webinar started. Great. Thank you, Sam, and thanks for, to everyone for joining us. Just uh, right off the bat, a little bit about the Clean Energy States Alliance, otherwise known as CESA. We are a national nonprofit. We are based in Montpelier, Vermont, and we work with our membership, which is primarily made up of public agencies and organizations and state energy offices working to advance clean energy. And we work with them and on their behalf and also with federal agencies, some industry and other stakeholder representatives to develop and promote clean energy technology and markets. You can learn more about us at the URL at the bottom of the slide. And now a little bit about the report. Next slide, please, Sam. So about a month ago, we published the Community Campaigns for Renewable Heating and Cooling Technologies report. My colleague Georgina Terry is the lead author, and she is joining us on the webinar today, and we'll be moderating the Q&A. We wrote this report because 42% of the energy used in homes goes to space heating and cooling. And right now that sector is primarily served by fossil fuels and contributes about 11% of greenhouse gas emissions in the US that comes from, come from the heating sector. So switching to cleaner heating technologies like air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps can help us reduce fossil fuel fossil fuel use, can help us reduce emissions, and it can help cities and states meet their long-term energy and climate goals. But one thing that we've seen is that the market adoption of clean heating and cooling technologies has been relatively slow. And in efforts to accelerate the market and the adoption of clean heating and cooling technologies, cities and towns across the U.S. have launched these independent group purchasing community campaigns. They go by many names, uh, colloquially referred to as thermalized, most commonly referred to as, and most commonly referred to by HeatSmart. And these are modeled on the very popular and successful solarized campaigns that many of you may be familiar with. And these solarized campaigns offered bulk discount pricing through community en engaged and community outreach and community aggregated purchasing to accelerate PV deployment. And so the thermalized and heat smart are modeled on these solarized campaigns. 
HeatSmart campaigns have been tried throughout the country, but our report highlights four communities, Northampton in Massachusetts, Boulder in Colorado, Peaks Island in Maine, and Tompkins County in New York. The, the latter two we are featuring on a webinar, webinar part two, which is next Monday, August 5th, and today we're hearing from Northampton and Massachusetts about, uh, sorry, today we're hearing from Boulder and Massachusetts about the campaigns and campaign programs going on there. But one thing that we learned as we did the research for this report is that the different campaigns take different approaches to their community campaigns. They offer different technologies, they use different outreach methods, and they offer different lessons learned. In the last couple of years, New York and Massachusetts at the state level have run statewide statewide heat smart programs and they are providing funding and different kinds of support to communities. From our research into those communities as well as the ones mentioned in this report, we came away with four key takeaways and those are that program evaluation is needed, not just on the basics of the number of participants, the number of units installed, and basic metrics like that, but we're also looking for meaningful metrics such as whether costs were lowered, whether the campaigns are meeting their goals, what the performance of the equipment is really like, the impact on carbon reduction goals, and especially on market growth. Another takeaway is that Effective communication and outreach strategies need to be tailored for each community. Communities are unique, and so the outreach strategies deployed in each of these communities needs to match the needs of that community. And so different outreach strategies should be used. Another lesson learned is that communities need spokespersons, the community campaigns need champions. And as we'll hear from some of the communities here, the ones that had a particular spokesperson of, or a champion to promote the program were quite effective at doing so. And also that financing and incentives are needed to remove the financial barriers facing homeowners, especially the low and moderate income communities. So that's just a little roundup on what this report is all about. The URL is up on your screen now and feel free to download it. And please join us next Monday for part two. And so we can move on now to our first presentation. Our first presenter is Carolyn Elam. She is the energy manager for the city of Boulder, where she's responsible for developing and implementing the city's strategy to address energy-related climate, climate impacts. Prior to joining the city in May of 2018, she managed Excel Energy's residential energy efficiency and low-income programs for Colorado and New Mexico. She brings more than 25 years of experience in energy efficiency and renewable energy at both the national and international level. I will introduce Meg Howard, our second speaker before her presentation. And now we can pass it over to Carolyn. Thanks, Carolyn. Great, thank you. And just getting my slide control. So thank you everyone um, for joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, I did wanna introduce you um, for a second to Boulder, Colorado. Um, so um, usually we put pictures, you know, in our slides more as bling and to break up the slides. I'm actually showing this because really our natural surroundings is, is sort of part of Boulder's identity and something that's particularly threatened um, by climate change. So we are nestled in the foothills um, just outside Denver, Colorado. Our population about 110,000, um, home to the University of Colorado, as well as um, particularly a lot of startup in the science and tech industry area. Um, we do have some large industry. I note the marijuana facilities are actually 2% of our energy use within the city. Um, and then lots of outdoor activities. Um, as Val mentioned, uh, when we look at our emissions goals, so we, like many communities, have been active in trying to address climate change. We've adopted the 80% by 2050 goal that many communities have. Um, from an emission standpoint within our community, electricity use is about half of our emissions. Our building stock in total is about 70% and the balance is transportation. Um, 
not a lot of large other industrial sources, although some, but really addressing our building stock is kind of foundational um, to addressing our climate goals. I'll also note that just last week, um, as a community, we went ahead and um, declared a formal climate emergency, um, really recognizing that our path um, to 80% by 2050 may not be aggressive enough, that the science is pointing us towards um, heading towards the tipping point where we won't ever be able to recover. Um, so really ramping up our efforts and we're also launching uh, an update to our climate commitment. So from an energy perspective, <clears throat> we have three main action areas. So as I mentioned, electricity is about half of the total emissions associated with the community. And so we have goals around 100% renewable electricity supply. So that only gets us halfway there, though we need to electrify our vehicles and buildings and push them onto that renewable electric supply. Um, maximizing efficiency is always just critical to enabling any of that from um, to happen. So why do we care so much about natural gas? Um, in addition to just hitting our climate goals, um, there's other real significant considerations within our scope and what we're really looking at. Uh, we do have natural gas wells um, in Boulder County and about 65% of them leak methane. Um, we know from recent science that there's eight times the increased risk of cancer um, when you're exposed to high amounts of methane. 30% increased indoor air pollution, um, so we see um, significantly higher asthma cases in homes with um, both natural gas um, for air furnaces as well as those located near um, natural gas infrastructure. And then methane has 84 times the impact of uh, carbon dioxide and as far as greenhouse uh, gases and global warming potential go. So with that, we set um, natural gas reduction goals um, for our community in addition to just our 80% greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and you'll see here, I'm really going to focus on residential today because it really makes up the bulk of what we're trying to achieve within our time frame on natural gas reduction. So we're really looking at having to get 85% of the natural gas out of our residential building stock by 2050. We're also taking on commercial and industrial, but recognizing where the technology is at today, um, we're really focused um, first on residential and hoping that technology catches up um, on the larger commercial side um, so that we can begin to address that in the coming years. <clears throat> So I'm principally going to be talking about um, our focus on retrofit and the campaigns we did around heat pumps, but I did also just want to mention that we do have a multi-pronged approach to trying to address natural gas use in our homes and our businesses. Um, so I did mention, uh, so I wanted to mention that we do have our building codes and they're on track for net zero um, for all new construction major renovations by 2031. And Commensurate with that, we also have solar ready and EV ready requirements, which really become particularly critical um, as we start to talk about both heat pump adoption um, and how we really make this an economically viable model for our, our residents. What it means for residential building codes is um, right now, um, the blue line I'm showing on the screen to 2017, ERI requirements is that any home over <clears throat> essentially 4,500 or 5,000 square feet um, built today within uh, Boulder, which coincidentally is a little bit over half of our total new um, construction in residential, has been built to net zero. And when we build a net zero, that means that um, you can't put enough solar on the rooftops within our regulation to um, allow for natural gas use and heating. So we've effectively eliminated um, natural gas heating from our new construction. Um, that will be ratcheted down next year to anything over 3,000 square foot, which is essentially any new home built in Boulder. So from a new construction standpoint, we really feel like we have this issue uh, more or less tackled. Obviously, um, there's still some nuances to it, but I think we're well on track there in new construction. But as a community, we actually don't have a large new construction base going on. Um, we're pretty well established. We have renovations and um, major modifications to some of our building stock, but not so much um, a lot of new construction. <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, about a year and a half ago, we launched um, our real focus on residential heating and cooling. Um, partnering, um, reaching out to all the leading heat pump manufacturers. Um, Mitsubishi in particular stepped up within our community. Um, we also partnered with U.S. cities, um, New York, City of Boston, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Burlington, as well as ourselves, um, partnered through the Urban Sustainability Directors Network on this campaign effort. 
And so we started our launch. And Mitsubishi, um, so you mentioned uh, buying down or bulk purchase. In our case, we didn't do a bulk community purchase, but we did partner with Mitsubishi to offer additional incentives as well as um, they partnered and did quite a bit of marketing. So what are we talking about as far as building stock within the Boulder community? Um, this is our, essentially our makeup of how our community um, gets heating right now. You'll see central furnaces, um, forced air furnaces make up the bulk of our heating stock. We do have some amount of electric baseboard. Hydronic baseboard is popular here. There's a few wood stoves still, um, and then there's some heat, there's been some heat pump adoption over time, but you can see what a small percentage it is of the, the total community. The other interesting piece about this and why the timing of our campaign was particularly useful is as a community, we didn't have a large amount of cooling um, already installed in homes. Maybe about half of our homes had some level of cooling, a lot of it's um, evaporative cooling, so not a lot of central air conditioning. But with the effects of climate change, we're already seeing significantly more days over 90 degrees. Our average temperature has gone up two degrees. So we're seeing much higher installation of cooling technologies, which is a great time when you're thinking about a heat pump adoption campaign. It's much easier to intercept customers or residents when they're thinking about adding cooling, because it's something that's not quite as critical to um, life. Uh, you can afford to have a few more hot days. Um, it's really much harder to intervene during the, the heating months. If your furnace goes out, we're really talking about um, pipes freezing, life, you know, being able to survive within your home. So people are going to call the um, HVAC company and they're going to put whatever's on the truck in. And so it's really hard to intercept somebody at that decision point, uh, much easier when we're talking about uh, summer cooling. We can't play the video for you today, but I did want to point this um, link out. Um, we did make some videos and some educational materials for our campaign, and this particular video is uh, one of our community members who's well known within our community, and he's talking about cutting the natural gas line to his home. So he did go through a retrofit, talks about the insulation upgrades and other things he did to make it happen, um, as well as the solar he has on his home. So it's a very nice uh, campaign video, as well as just one that we continue to use for educational purposes. Our focus of our campaign was really around, again, starting with a cooling season, um, enhanced comfort, health, um, so getting rid of natural gas and methane inside the homes, addressing indoor air quality, flexibility. We were working largely on a campaign focused around mini splits, so really doing a lot of education on mini split technology, so the flexibility that allowed you, improving your efficiency, and then lowering your carbon footprint since, but even with our grid mix today here in Colorado, heat pumps will lower the emissions impact, um, and that's only going to get better. And then our rebates were offered. We named our campaign Comfort 365, uh, Renewable Cooling and Heating. Um, and then we just swapped it for the summer or for the winter months to Comfort 365, Renewable Heating and Cooling. We did a three-phase campaign, which is represented um, in the report out um, that Georgina will um, prepared for on our project as well as others. Um, we continue to run this campaign um, this summer, um, but this the data I'll show and talk to you in more detail is um, really around this early spring, summer, winter campaign. We, as well as our partners, um, did put quite a bit of money in the form of rebates. Um, so this slide just shows you what we had. We weren't just focused on the heating um, for space heating, but we also uh, marketed around heat pump water heaters as well, since that's also um, predominantly the, our form of water heating is natural gas based here. Um, so with all of the incentives in, a resident seeking to add a heat pump to their home could get somewhere between $1,000 and $1,400 towards the cost of that heat pump. Um, if they were going for a water heater, that was um, $900. And so this is ours, the counties, as well as our utility, which is Excel, as well as the $300 incentive that Mitsubishi put into our market. We also did a pilot concurrent with this, which um, was another focused marketing campaign called the Residential Roadmap to Renewable Energy Living. And here we prepared, um, we had energy models um, of all the homes and residents within the city based on permit data as well as other information. We were able to target um, a set of residents who were candidates um, for adding solar 
key pumps and efficiency to their homes. And we threw an additional $1,500 on top of the previous incentives you saw towards those um, to try and market greater uptake. You know, the point behind this campaign um, and the really the theory of change around that is that through increased awareness and creating compelling alternatives, plus support for adoption in the form of financial incentives, um, plus de-emphasizing um, the status quo and social norming would get us the change we wanted. And so we tackled every one of those um, through our campaigns. Um, creating the video as you um, will see when you get a chance to look at it for the social norming. Um, and then really um, we removed all incentives um, from the Boulder, from the city of Boulder and the county that favor the incumbent technology or natural gas or central air conditioning. So really I think that's an important lesson learned for us. Um, it is also one of the challenges we continue to face because our utility did not do the same and they continue to market, particularly in heating season, natural gas technologies. And so we're competing against incentives there that um, often present a challenge for us if we're trying to get people to adopt a heat pump. So what happened? Um, as a result of our campaign, we saw what we're estimating to be um, 200 to 300% increase in heat pump adoption, which sounds like a really exciting number. Um, I will say that that's from about less than 50 a year to somewhere akin to 200 a year, so it's still a really small number. Um, so we're just really um, catching a percentage. We're about on par with um, what we were seeing in central air conditioning adoption though, so that was promising for us. Um, one of the things within our community, and I'm sure this is true across the board, your permitting data is your um, best measurement, um, but not all systems are getting permitted within our community. It's particularly relevant here within Boulder where much of the community is in a floodplain and permits trigger things that people want to avoid. And, and so we do believe that our numbers were higher than what we were actually estimating, um, but still not on the order of magnitude we're gonna need to see if we um, want to hit our total 85% uh, conversion that we, we need to achieve. Um, another interesting note is not everyone went through our rebate program. Um, so actually, through our Energy Smart program where all those you know, $1,000 to $1,400 rebates um, were offered, we actually had a fairly small number of people that went through that program. Some of this um, had to do with requirements around um, the heat pump specifications and the minimal efficiencies. Um, others went around um, just maybe not a good transfer of information from our contractors. So our contractors were doing a good job marketing within our market, but not necessarily closing the loop and connecting customers with our advisors and our rebate processing team. So that was um, an interesting thing for us to note and how to break that down and make it easier because we want to retain the connection with these residents who are making this decision for both informing you know, how the technology is working as, as well as making other upgrades to their home in the future. Um, high system costs, I'll run through some numbers here on that in a minute, um, is certainly a barrier um, to people I'm making the choice. And I also wanted to mention the limitations of the technology choices. So I'm sure many communities are like ours. Our homes um, for the furnaces, these are designed for furnaces with outputs on the order of 40,000 BTU or higher. Um, and currently there's not a good heat pump solution um, for that that could slot in and, and take advantage of the existing infrastructure within the home. And so that tends to drive people uh, more towards mini splits. Um, with, uh, with the mini splits, you're doing an individual uh, zone control, which is great from an efficiency standpoint, but if you have a home with a large number of rooms or certain types of layouts, heat pumps aren't, um, mini splits aren't necessarily the best design choice for you. And so we did lose a lot of folks um, through that process um, because they would have to put so many mini split heads into their home that the costs were prohibitive or there wasn't a great technology solution. And so we're continuing to work with manufacturers to see um, where the technology choices they get. I should caveat mine and say that you know, these were limitations principally around um, cold climate heat pumps, which is something that we really need to have here um, in Colorado. Uh, maybe not as much of an issue. I think you have larger systems available if you don't require the cold climate rated um, units. Um, I will talk through this a little bit here. So 
when you're really talking about adopting a heat pump, um, if you're going to do it right, the first thing you're going you're gonna to do is um, improve the efficiency of your home so that you're right-sizing your unit and, and maximizing the output of it. Um, typically, that's around a $5,000 investment that you're going to need to make. To put the appliance in, um, you know, if you're doing both, uh, in this case, I'm showing a picture of a mini split unit, um, as well as the tank um, water heater, you're looking at something on the order of eighteen to twenty thousand um, dollars all in once you um, add all of that equipment in, and then because our natural gas prices are so low here in Colorado, we're amongst the lowest in in the country. Um, if you just do those two pieces, you're going to be paying more on your utility bill. And so from a, for many homes, I guess I should say, um, that's going to be the case. And so you really want to install your um, PV on your roof at the same time to manage your bill. And so that's another $15,000 investment. So really what we were seeing um, for our households is somewhere on the order of $38,000, $40,000 um, for the type of renovation that was necessary to really maximize the performance of the heat pump as well as keep the costs, um, operating costs the lowest. Um, so this really presents kind of one of our biggest lessons learned is, you know, for an individual homeowner at that kind of price, we're really only getting our early adopters or people where it really made sense to them from a um, technology perspective, like they were renovating a home, they were going to be doing much of this anyway, um, and so the heat pump was just an incremental cost. Um, looking at that at a community level, if we need to do um, all 18,000 single-family households within our community, we're looking at a, a community cost of almost $700 million. Um, so that is a huge barrier for us. So what comes next? Um, you know, one of our biggest lessons learned is while they were very valuable in helping create awareness and getting some early adopters and really helping us learn about the technology, um, rebates and voluntary programs are going to be insufficient for us to hit our goals. That said, we're going to continue them um, because these awareness campaigns are important for really making more and more people familiar with the technology, what heat pumps have to offer. They also help us continue to intercept people at decision points. So when they are at a, at a decision point um, where we can offer this technology solution and drive them towards it, we still want to do that. But going forward, our focus really needs to shift towards further breaking down the financial barriers um, to electrification of existing building stock. So we're going to be focusing in looking at state-level policy changes that can help create more incentives um, for fuel switching, perhaps establish partnerships and provide energy services um, as a way of financing retrofits to people's home or other things, um, certainly tariff-based financing and other solutions like that are of interest um, to us. So with that, I will conclude and pass it back um, to Val. Thanks, Carolyn. All right, just a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of both presentations. Next, I'd like to introduce Meg Howard, who is a program manager at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and she sits on their clean heating and cooling team where she manages the solar hot water, modern wood heating and residential air source heat pump rebate programs. She also leads the community-based outreach program called Heat Smart Mass, which she's going to be talking about today. And she supports other strategic initiatives on the team. Before joining Mass CEC, she worked in green building consulting and in energy facility siting for the Department of Public Utilities. Welcome, Meg. One more thing before Meg hops on, I just want to mention that while the, the Clean Heating and Cooling Communities Campaign Report featured Northampton, Mass as one of the communities, Meg is um, talking about Heat Smart Mass, the, the program itself. And Meg, I don't know how many details, if any, you have on the on the Northampton campaign, but just um, if folks are thinking about typing questions about Northampton specifically, keep that in mind. Thanks. Thanks, Val. Um, I don't have a 
ton of uh, specific details about Northampton in here. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of context of how that relates to our Heat Smart program, um, but happy to, to do my best to, to try and answer any of the questions or else turn them over uh, to Georgina and Val. Um, so like Val said, I'm going to talk about uh, the Massachusetts Heat Smart program. Um, first, start with a little bit uh, of motivation, and I think it was some great context we just told, heard from Carolyn, um, and you know, really what the city of Boulder is doing is kind of nation leading in the heat pump arena. So, so I was very glad to hear that presentation. Um, Going to say similar things in terms of our, our motivation. Uh, space heating and water heating represent a huge fraction of the emissions in Massachusetts. Um, this is statewide in residential buildings. It's up at 60, 70% of, of a building's emissions come from heating, which is primarily fossil fuels here in Massachusetts as well. Um, and to get, we have also committed to the 80 by 50 goals, although we're hearing more and more that may not be enough, but you know, to get to 80 by 50 goals is gonna have to be a huge part of that solution. Um, you know, we're working on documents about how to get there. Last year, our state put out a comprehensive energy plan uh, and it really showed the need for adoption of clean heating and cooling technologies to, to do anything uh, approaching our 80 by 50 targets. Um, so this is kind of the governor's uh, headline quote about the report. And even up there, he's emphasizing that we're going to need to electrify our homes. Um, that report showed that we need to, they had kind of scenarios between half a million and three quarters of a million homes um, on heat pumps by 2030 to kind of have us on the trajectory we want to go on. For reference, uh, Mass EC has been running an air source heat pump rebate program for the last three plus years, and we've had uh, just over 20,000 homes in those three years. Um, so getting to half a million is, is a real big jump. And uh, I guess for another point of reference, it's um, you know somewhere between 20 and 30% of our homes need to be on heat pumps by 2030. Um, Right now, that's kind of a negligible amount of homes that are heating primarily with heat pumps. Um, and then at the same time, our polling showing that, you know, half the state is, is totally unaware that these technologies even exist, uh, much less kind of on a pathway to considering them. Um, so we're, we're, we're facing a big challenge um, and really looking for all the tools in our toolbox um, and, um, you know, had some good success with the Solarize Mass program, so hoping to replicate that model. Um, so for a little more uh, history of these kinds of programs in Massachusetts, uh, in 2011, we launched the Solarize Mass program. Uh, it's now been carried out in over, uh, I think, around 70 communities and installed 3,400 megawatts of solar. Um, really had some good success in terms of increasing adoption and driving down costs. Uh, in 2017, the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, um, which is a, a project of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network that Carolyn mentioned, uh, funded five New England communities to run these kind of renewable thermal community campaigns, including Heat Smart Northampton, which is described in the report. So Mass DC didn't directly support that uh, program in Northampton. Um, but then that same year, we launched Solarize Plus which allowed uh, communities as well, in addition to PV, to support clean heating technologies, uh, solar hot water and electric vehicles. Now it includes batteries. Um, and then the next year, 2018, we launched our, our own Heat Smart uh, Mass community programs uh, in four partner communities. And we use the same technical consultant as Heat Smart Northampton, uh, Cadmus. So we were able to um, pull in a lot of the lessons learned uh, from Heat Smart Northampton as well as the other New England campaigns um, directly from them. You know, we, we connected with the folks in Northampton, but also were able to, to use Cadmus as a, uh, a knowledge uh, repository. Um, so going forward, we're, we're continuing to run Heat Smart Mass. This year, we're in the middle of a sign up period with four more communities uh, and hoping to continue running it as one of the the many tools in our toolbox to get to where we need to go. Uh, so a little bit more about what the model looks like here in Massachusetts. Um, I am describing as Mass EC runs the program, but this is actually pretty similar to the way Northampton ran the program. Um, for our HeatSmart campaigns, we 
uh, MassEC, along with our sister agency, Department of Energy Resources, will put out a request for proposals to town. Uh, we engage the technical consultant I mentioned, Cadmus, and then we'll help the selected communities manage the installer RFP pro process and then just kind of uh, provide the framework for running the campaign in terms of providing some support on marketing and education. Uh, the, the kind of core of, of these campaigns are really dependent on community organizers. Um, so that's led by this role we call coaches, it's kind of a lead volunteer uh, with, a, with a team of volunteers supporting them, um, as well as we, we like to have someone from the municipality on board too. Um, and they're really the ones that drive the installer selection process and then the outreach process within their community. Uh, and then the kind of the third prong here is installers. Um, so they'll communities will select uh, partner installers that they want to promote, who then uh, provide free site assessments as well as a kind of fixed pricing. They'll um, then do the installation and then an ongoing basis offer servicing and maintenance. And the final prong here is um, just community members. You know, it's up to them to, to actually sign up for these assessments, install the technologies, and hopefully spread the word and talk to their neighbors. Uh, one quick note while I'm on this slide, I will say our campaign, we promote um, air source heat pumps uh, as well as ground source heat pumps, modern wood heating, um, and solar hot water. And it's up to each of the communities to select which of those four technologies they want to promote. So we've had communities do just one, communities do all four, and kind of every combination in between based on what seems to fit their community best. Uh, in terms of outreach strategies, I want to echo something Val said at the beginning. It, you know, we really found it varies by community. So I'm, I'm showing you a chart of, you know, we did a survey of the pilot participants, what worked in their community. Um, you see local newspapers up at the top, but I wouldn't want the takeaway to be like, okay, just use the newspaper. Um, I think it's really key to have those community volunteers uh, or champions, as Val called them, who know the community and know, okay, in my town, uh, everyone's on next door or people really do read the newspaper here um, you know this event's going to be well attended I think having that local knowledge of what people in the town or city um, use uh, for, for communication is really key to leveraging this kind of community-based social marketing model um, so I'll just list a couple of the other strategies we've used but but know that it, it has varied uh, widely community to community um, every campaign we kick off with a meet the installer night where we bring the selected installers in in person to the town hall or a high school auditorium and people get to uh, hear from us, hear from the volunteers and then primarily meet the installers. We've also provided each of the campaigns a website uh, which is a repository for information as well as a place for people to sign up as leads. Uh, outreach through community groups has been key. Um, uh, we've used social media, uh, including ads, traditional media like newspapers, um, which can either be ads or op-eds, articles. Um, mailers and utility bill inserts have been successful, especially in some communities. And if you have a utility, that, uh, like an electric utility, uh, that's willing to, to promote the campaign, that's, that's great. Um, we found in some communities where that coordination hasn't worked out, the town still has access to maybe a water bill. Um, or a uh, town uh, tax bill to get the message out, um, and then just tabling at events like farmers markets, town days, local festivals, banners and lawn signs, kind of get the, the, the word out there. I guess we've had um, maybe at least one community that did a billboard, and then open houses in homes of people who have installed these technologies and want to invite their neighbors into their homes to kind of touch and feel and see what these technologies actually look like. So uh, the communities that participated in our pilot were kind of across the state um, from one community in the far western part of our state, um, a couple more eastern, and then uh, Nantucket, uh, who's an island um, there with some unique circumstances. Um, in this current second round that I mentioned, we're in our communities that applied happen to be more clustered in kind of the metro, greater metro Boston area. So some results from our pilot, we had uh, across the four communities, we had 684 people sign up saying they're interested in the program, which translated into 449 site visits from the installers, uh, which turned into 117 contracts. 
so far, oh, and this was the distribution between the technologies. Uh, air source was definitely our most popular uh, with a pretty strong showing from ground source heat pumps as well. And then in the community campaigns that are ongoing, they're set to run through the end of this year. So these are really um, pretty early results because we know we always see a big rush and sign up towards the end of the campaign. Um, we have so far 501 uh, unique leads. 300 site visits and 56 contracts. Again, with AirSource uh, as a dominant one, and this time Solar Hot Water is having a, a strong showing. Um, so one thing I'll say here, just in terms of like other cities and states that are thinking of running this kind of campaign, you know, and comparing it to rebates, um, we did invest. You know, we spent a good bit of money on um, consultants. So when we look at like what is Per project installed, what what were, was the cost um, for the pilot round? It was um, about three thousand dollars per contract. So if you compare that to rebates, um, you know it's pretty high. And that was actually on top of our, you know, we had rebates for all these technologies. Um, however, we're hoping by the this current round that's down at two thousand or lower, and kind of going down from there on out. Um, if you want to run these campaigns, you know, just as we build our knowledge. So so if other uh, jurisdictions want to run the campaigns, we're happy to um, share our resources. You know, I think the report that CIS has done is uh, hopefully great at helping kind of lower the, the pilot and the learning cost. Um, and then some other benefits we have, we see in this kind of program relative to a rebate is, you know, it's not just the, the project that was put in, but there's really an outreach. So you hope that you're reaching, um, you know, kind of getting more bang for your buck that way in terms of raising awareness and getting more people to start thinking about these technologies. Um, also, the materials we develop out of this, we can use for other things uh, in terms of outreach statewide. Um, and uh, um, I will also note that this campaign is, is a lot more expensive than Solarize just because we did um, have more technical consultant support. We felt like, especially early on, um, that was important for these technologies that are just pretty complicated in terms of how they interact with people's homes. Uh, so some metrics. Val was talking about program evaluation. How do we do compared to what we targeted? Um, the first one, uh, we targeted 15% project cost reductions compared to the state average. And this is a big thing that Solarized Mass has been able to deliver, um, you know, 15, even up to 20% cost reductions compared to average solar prices at the time of the campaign. Um, we did not achieve that. In fact, our projects were 7 to 47%, uh, depending on the technology in the town above statewide average. Um, and then even if you look at regional average, they were kind of right around regional average, plus or minus 3%, but they weren't achieving cost reductions. So I'm going to talk a lot more about that in a moment, but just note that we didn't achieve those cost reductions. Um, however, we still did see people going forward with projects. Um, we had, were targeting a 10% contract closure rate. Um, we hit 17, which is about on par with what we were seeing through our Solarize campaigns and kind of the, what we've heard as the HVAC industry average. So people still chose to move forward um, for other reasons, um, not just the cost reduction. Um, and then this last metric is a little bit complicated. Basically, we wanted a way to see like how large an impact we we're having in terms of accelerating adoption. We've been running um, rebate programs in these communities for the last three years. So we wanted to see HeatSmart uh, double the number of um, contracts compared to the rebate volume from the previous three years. Um, so a pretty good acceleration of adoption. We, you know, got that, um, you know, we beat this metric by a wide margin on the ground source side. Um, we were kind of just a little bit under it on solar hot water. I think we'll beat it this year on solar hot water. Um, Air source was a little bit below it, um, that there was more widespread market penetration of air source heat pumps, um, at least people doing kind of supplementary or one zone heat pumps in these towns. So we didn't we didn't quite hit it there, um, but definitely saw in all the communities um, a jump in terms of um, adoption compared to to what we had seen in the previous years. Uh, a few other impacts of the program model. Um, we got three and a half percent of all households participating. In some communities, that was up to five percent. Um, so really good penetration. Uh, respondents reported that they really increased their knowledge of the technologies, which was a big goal of ours. Of the people who contracted, a lot of them said that having that vetted installer and equipment was really important to their decision. 
Uh, and then this is just showing the, the carbon benefit that the projects installed has. Um, one success story that I wanted to highlight from this pilot was the ground source heat pump technology. Um, initially, none of the communities that applied to our pilot were interested in promoting that. For the sake of the pilot, we talked a couple of them into it, uh, and then we saw it ended up being about 30% of all the contracts we had in our program. Um, and just in those communities, you know, the, the light blue graph represents everything they'd had in the previous three years and just a big jump up uh, during the HeatSmart campaigns. Um, so for some communities, at least, you know, education around the ground source heat pump technology can really make a big difference. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skim over some of these, but I'll talk in a little more depth about the, the cost one. But um, at a high level, uh, finding installers in some communities in our state was very difficult. The far community, Great Barrington and far western Mass um, and Nantucket, the island. This map shows our rebate program participation, and you can see that it kind of varies by parts of the state. And we found the HVAC industry uh, really is a pretty local industry, at least for most businesses. Um, and then this this kind of program we also found was a little bit of a less track, attractive a proposition to HVAC installers than PV installers um, for a couple reasons, you know, especially in summer when they're already kind of at full capacity. They're not interested in bringing in more leads. Um, so this is still a kind of a challenge for us to face in uh, round two. Uh, we did more outreach to installers, but I think we also just got lucky that, that the communities had a stronger installer base that applied. Um, so this is the one I did want to spend some more time talking about. Um, you know, like I said, for SolarEdge, this is a graph we always show. Look, you know, this is how we're going to lower the cost stack and really get that dollar savings for the customer through going through this program. Um, at a high level, you know, that didn't happen through HeatSmart. Um, a couple reasons why. Um, regional cost of labor really vary in our state, um, and a lot of the contracts that were signed were in the metro Boston area with a higher cost of labor. Um, but even beyond that, like I said, we still were just kind of at regional cost. Uh, not below them. So why was that? Um, one, during the installer selection, community members really prioritized quality. I mean, obviously quality is always important, um, but I think even more so than PV, this is an installer who's going to be going into your neighbor's homes, designing their heating system. Um, you know, it's really kind of a, a personal, intimate thing, and um, you know, picking that installer who who really seemed top quality was was a key motivator for the community volunteers. Uh, there's just less ability to get discounts from bulk purchasing. As talked about in the report, um, you know, if you're installing just air source heat pumps, there's 12 different sizes you might need to do, and you don't know which ones are going to be right for the community. So um, there's kind of less ability to do that bulk purchasing than you might have with one or two panels. Uh, the HVAC industry already has lower customer acquisition costs, and people need heating and cooling. So, so these co companies have traditionally had to work uh, less hard uh, to get in leads. And then some of the pilot communities were relatively affluent, and we saw them selecting, you know, some adders, um, you know, kind of, you know, the same way people want to pay for a Tesla to drive, they're, you know, having kind of the top of line heating system uh, has a real benefit to, to some people who can afford to pay for it. Uh, so this round, we've really tried to reframe the program and tried to manage expectations. You know, I think it's been compared to Solarize a lot. A lot of our communities did Solarize. Um, so we want to kind of not have them think about it in that way, but think of it more in terms of this campaign provides transparent pricing and you're also getting a vetted installer, um, you know, kind of a top quality installer who's offering discounts from their own standard pricing. Uh, another big lesson we learned is it's difficult to standardize pricing. So, you know, transparent pricing is important, but it's, you know, really not the industry model to have a standard design. I'm not expecting anyone to look at the graphic I put. It's just a screenshot of uh, what our cost adder sheets look like, and it's just meant to illustrate that, you know, this is this is us trying to simplify it, and it's still very complicated. Um, but you know, each of these jobs is just kind of more individually engineered than a PV project. Um, Carolyn alluded to the the cost proposition. Also for us um, in Massachusetts, natural gas is cheaper than electricity for most homes to heat with. Um, so we really want to target high cost heating fuels and focus on other benefits of the technology, including improved comfort. Um, cooling is a big part of that. Um, 
you know, but there could be other aspects of, you know, better zoning, you know, kind of better whole home comfort, uh, and then the environmental you know, benefits to these technologies. Uh, one other thing I'll just highlight that, you know, I think that we could really better integrate this with our efficiency programs than we've done in the past. Those have been run by a separate entity than us, so something we're aware of and, and promote efficiency, but I'd really like to see that get stronger. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, a big value to, to us as the Mass Clean Energy Center is that running these campaigns um, really increases our knowledge. Um, you know, a big thanks to all the volunteers who do these campaigns and, you know, it's an education opportunity for us to understand, oh, okay, to actually put in a heat pump, you're going to need an electric service upgrade and that's going to add another $3,000 to the cost of the project. And what does that look like? And therefore, what kind of educational resources do we need to create to help people go through that process? Uh, so it's really a great educational opportunity for us. So in general, I think we've had some good success in increasing awareness. Uh, and driving adoption through this program. I think it works pretty well in some communities, uh, but it's definitely something that we want to continue refining this program to making it to make it better serve uh, more communities in our state. Um, so thank you all, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Val. Thanks, Meg. Great results from your pilot program and the pilot program impacts. And I, I love that success story on ground source seat pumps and what happened as a result of education about what they are and getting the communities to offer that. So we're going to switch to a moderated Q&A. And I wanted to introduce Georgina Terry, who's a research associate at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and she was the lead on this report. So she's going to take it from here. Georgina? Thanks, Val. I have a couple of questions here. This first one can be answered, I think, both by Carol and Meg. Uh, two people have asked this question. Did you consider using on-bill financing for this program? And in line with that, how about inclusive financing? Were those options that were under consideration? Um, so this is Carol, and I can start. Um, so on bill, we don't have a, any programs within um, our service territory, either through our water utility or through our um, electric utility for on bill financing. Um, many of our um, participants, though, did go through the Boulder County program, which is um, uh, through our clean energy credit union. So getting um, at least financing assistance. Uh, but yes, on bill wasn't an option for us. This is Meg. Um, um, we also didn't have an option to do on-bill financing. Um, it's not something that exists um, residentially in Massachusetts. Um, we, our utilities, though, do offer a 0% interest loan for seven years. So um, it's only uh, accessible to those who have good enough credit. But um, for those that do, it's really a huge um, asset in terms of us promoting these technologies. How about this question? for Carolyn. Carolyn, did Boulder look at geothermal heat pumps at all? Yeah, so <clears throat> I didn't mention it, but um, we did um, see some of those installed as well, similar to what Meg said, um, some uptake there. It's still a relatively small percentage. Um, those were principally some of our larger homes that um, really the mini splits weren't an option for and the had the limitation I mentioned on the um, the ducted air source side, and so they went more towards the ground source geothermal based technology. How about one thing you mentioned? One of your slides on the uh, Boulder heat pump marketing campaign referred to a three phase campaign. And under spring, it says cooling focus with push on true greens. What do you mean by true greens? So we've demographically characterized our, our community, and so we know, um, for example, who has purchased um, solar for their homes or um, have done other efficiency upgrades or things um, where they've participated within our system. And so we really target those. Those are the people I'm going to call some of the early adopters or ones who have taken prior steps around efficiency or solar. Is that connected at all with the Radiant Lab scraping of data? Yes, that's that's correct. So looking at both you, permitting data, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, just explain the Radiant Labs is that's a really interesting process. Can you go into just a little more depth about how you used that and what they did? 
Yeah, for folks on the phone, so Radiant Labs um, is a, a consultant organization, contractor in our or, um, organization in our area, um, but they are actually working with several of our city partners as well now. And they partnered with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, as well as their own capabilities around home energy audits and developed a tool by which they could um, characterize each home within our community. And so they coupled in permit data. So like NREL would develop the energy model. So this is what this age home in this part of the community typically functions at. Then we take permitting data to know like when these homes had had some action taken on them around principally heating and cooling or solar. And then we would run filters on that and pick out the people, um, for example, people we knew had not pulled a cooling permit, so likely did not have cooling on their homes would be ones that we would target um, with our summer campaign, recognizing that as temperatures are warming, these may be people considering adopting cooling. Or we would tailor some language to the folks who had solar around really enhancing the use of their solar um, and bringing it into their cool, um, heating and cooling arena more. And so that's how we use this tool is to really do more targeted campaigning. Meg, was the Tableau tool that you used similar to uh, the one that Carolyn used? Is that a same technology or something different? Um, so some of the maps I showed were done in Tableau. That, that's just kind of data, data visualization of the results we had. Um, Cadmus did, as a technical consultant, pull together some data. Um, you know, we work with each town to get their, their um, permitting and property assessor data to try and do a, do a similar thing, um, you know, also looking at factors like who had solar, who had electric vehicles, um, to try and do some similar targeted marketing. Um, one of the um, one of the publications that was mentioned was the residential roadmap to renewable energy living. Yes. And, Forgive me, I've forgotten that. Was that with Carolyn or Meg? <laughs> yeah, it was with me. Yes, Carolyn. Uh, the uh, person asking the question wonders if that's available to the public or can it be downloaded somewhere? Um, so we, uh, Radiant Labs and their their partners are working um, on a web-based version of that. So the goal is to make that tool more broadly available. Right now, it was just utilized by um, a for our pilot we had a company, Fuel Switch, which is a spinoff of Radiant Labs, who was going out and doing the marketing um, to test it. Um, but we are looking to, to broaden the applicability of it. So more to come on that. Okay, so the slide which showed, it, it looks like a little booklet, so it's not really a little booklet. That's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, correct. It, it's, um, you know, it's basically a personalized um, flyer or something that explains to you like based on you know what, what we think we know about your home and then things that you answer about your home what your potential paybacks would look like what different packages would look like in terms of savings um you know where how much it might potentially cost um and then move you to the next step where you would you know get a formal quote and really size the system appropriately but really as a marketing team to make it more tailorized to the individual uh, another question here for both of you, and maybe we can start with Meg on this one. Can you go into a little bit more detail about the strategies you use to recruit your campaign volunteers? So we, um, like I said, put out a request for proposals of interested communities. Um, I think we really were building on the human infrastructure created through the Solarize Mass campaigns. Um, not all of our heat smart communities, but a majority of them had previously done Solarize campaigns. So they had um, some experience with this kind of campaigns as well as existing volunteer networks. Um, otherwise, when we were doing outreach, we um, you know, talked to our regional planning authorities, talked to um, other statewide kind of clean energy community programs, to try and get the word out there. Um, but I do think we got a big assist from the existing Solarize uh, volunteer networks. Carolyn, how about on your side? Yeah, so we didn't have quite as much of a volunteer base um, as what Meg described in her program. Really, we had some early adopters who did a lot of word of mouth sharing with neighbors. We, we did a couple of 
um, events promoted through Nextdoor where you know we, people could come and do an open house at my colleague Brett's home. Um, the rest of it was more um, paid, and so we we have our Energy Smart advisory team who reached out to did a lot of marketing to participants already in that program, and the rest was paid paid marketing. And similar to what Meg mentioned, we did everything from direct mail, we did on bill inserts into our water utility as well as Facebook, Nextdoor, and other um, paid advertising. Super. Well, I won't ask any more questions because I see we're at the end of the hour. Val, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks, Georgina. You're welcome. And thanks to everyone for listening in. I just want to put in another plug for the upcoming webinar. Sam, if you can advance the slide. On Monday, August 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're holding our part two. We're going to highlight two more communities from the report, both peak Island from Maine and Tompkins County in New York and we will also have NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority joining us on the call who will be talking about their statewide clean heating and cooling campaigns program. So we hope you'll be able to join us then. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Meg, for your terrific presentations and all that information. I hope it was useful to everyone on the line and have a great day.